Ancient Murder and Mayhem, The Jaded Love Murders, Miloy, Greenhill, Urin, 1901. Vinton Malloy paced up and down St. Louis Street in DeSoto, Missouri. It was dark, nearly 8 o'clock p.m. on a Saturday night, September 28, 1901. Mr. Malloy had tethered his horse some distance down the street. He was uneasy about his 30-year-old son, John Malloy, who was visiting Mrs. Sadie Uren, a pretty 28-year-old divorcee who owned the cottage house on the corner of the street next to her parents' home. His apprehension was well-founded. John was not the only suitor interested in the young woman, and her brothers, Will and Dan, had made it known that they did not welcome the attention his son was giving their sister. And to make matters worse, Mr. Malloy feared John would do something rash if push came to shove. Suddenly, the sickening sound of two gunshots split the quiet night. Mr. Malloy's knees nearly buckled before he was able to compose himself enough to run toward the cottage. By the time he reached the door, Bert Guion, a neighbor, was close behind him. The door sprang open, and Dan Malloy, recognizing the old gentleman, shouted, John is dead, and ought to have been dead long ago. Vinton Malloy pushed past him as Dan stood on the porch and cried out, The damned bastard has killed my sister. Mr. Malloy was met with the terrible sight of his son, sprawled lifeless on the floor. Blood splattered on the wall and floor, he was facing the bloodied, lifeless body of Sadie Greenhill Erin. Their bodies lay in front of a rocking chair and appeared as if she had been sitting on John's lap and they had slid off the chair. Both had been struck in the head by a sharp instrument. Vinton held John's head in his hands. It was cold. Members of Sadie's family were rushing around the room, but none of what he was seeing made any sense. Little did he know, things were about to become even more bizarre. Welcome to another episode of Old Fashioned Murder and Mayhem. I am your host, Mindy Hudson, bringing you tales of historical true crime with a twist of genealogy. The Jaded Love Murders, Miloy Greenhill Urin. 1901 is taken from my former podcast, Murder and Mayhem in Jefferson County, Missouri. It relates the bizarre story of Sadie Greenhill Uren, a young divorcee, and John Malloy, a suitor. The true story about what happened on the night they were killed remains a mystery, but the details are fascinating. Listener discretion is advised. Jefferson County, Missouri is located about 25 miles south of St. Louis. The town of DeSoto was founded in 1857. Its major industry was the railroad in that it served as home to St. Louis Iron Mountain and Southern, the Missouri Pacific, and Union Pacific Railroads. The railroad also played an integral role in the lives of today's subjects. Mary H. Greenhill, called Sadie, was born 1874 in Washington County, Missouri, to Robert Greenhill and Mary Honora Aubuchon. The Greenhill family moved to DeSoto in Jefferson County around 1890, where Robert worked as a blacksmith for the railroad. Sadie was the only girl having three brothers, Albert, William, and Daniel. Vivacious and beautiful, she easily won the hand of Albert Uren, an Englishman six years her senior, when she was 16. Mr. Uren owned and operated a cigar shop in DeSoto, but after the marriage he took a job at the railroad. Around 1899, a terrible accident at the rail yard led to the loss of his arm and leg. As a result, the railroad company awarded him $7,000 and an artificial leg as compensation. For a time, Mr. Uren tended bar, but later 
bought a truck, and sold vegetables. Sadie was still very young, fashionable, and restless. She obtained a divorce from Albert in September 1901, regained her maiden name, and moved back home into her parents' house. Still in love with his wife, Albert had given her most of the money from the settlement, leaving her wealthy. Sadie owned several parcels of property and fine horses, according to later newspaper accounts. She had lovely dark hair and flashing black eyes, which hinted at her French ancestry. Having newly acquired her freedom, she was anxious to enjoy the attentions of the many suitors who took no time calling upon her to the chagrin of her brothers, Will and Dan. Will, who was four years older than Sadie, had a mental disability. He generally followed whatever his hot-headed youngest sibling, Dan, did or said. Although Sadie could have chosen to live in the cottage which adjoined her parents' property, she decided to rent it out, and the prospects she decided to interview for the rental included at least two railroad employees whose intentions included more than finding a suitable place to live. They were very much interested in winning the affections of their landlady. The first suitor was Caleb W. Andrus, called Kale by everyone in DeSoto. The son of Rev. A. A. Andrus, he worked at the railroad and was rooming at the Bowen House in DeSoto in 1901. Although only 19 years old, he was taken by the beauty and outgoing personality of Sadie. Being the son of a Baptist preacher, courting her would have been a thorn in his father's side, which may or may not have added a little rebellious spice to the prospect. On the night of the murder, Cale arrived at Sadie's cottage early in the evening. Upon hearing that John Malloy was headed to the cottage, Sadie asked him to wait outside on the back stoop. Malloy had made no secret of his intention to marry her, and she feared he would be angry if he found her with another man. Cale agreed and made his way around the house to the back to wait. John Malloy, son of Vinton Malloy and Lorena Gardner, was the second son of the six children born to the marriage. He worked as a brakeman on the Iron Mountain Railroad and loved traveling around the country. Friends knew him as Spots Malloy and described him as jovial and congenial. However, there were some who considered him loud, boisterous, and drawn to the carefree wantonness of a bachelor's life. He had just returned from Texas the day of his murder and was anxious to see Sadie. He stopped by his parents for a meal that afternoon and seemed to be in good spirits. Afterward, it was revealed that he visited a few friends and asked to borrow a gun. The two younger Green Hill brothers had made it clear to all young men interested in their sister, and especially John Malloy, that they did not approve of her entertaining them, particularly since her divorce was so recent. In addition... They had threatened quite a few who had dared to divide them. Malloy had proposed marriage to Sadie, but she had rebuffed his offer. He would either have her or no one would. Nevertheless, he could not secure a weapon. Finally, he entered Slauson's hardware store and purchased a pistol and cartridges. He slipped the weapon into his pocket in case he needed it. Satisfied, he went into the commercial hotel and took some paper and a pen and composed a note. More on that later. All of his preparations done, Malloy made his way to St. Louis Street where he found Sadie putting up red chenille curtains in an entryway inside the cottage. Always fashionable, that Sadie. Her mother, Nora, came in for a moment and then left the two alone. It was getting close to 8 o'clock p.m. Whatever transpired within the next 30 minutes is anyone's guess. Perhaps, after consideration, Sadie had told him she would accept his proposal after all. 
or maybe he had threatened to shoot her and then himself if she continued to refuse him. What is known is that she was seated in his lap when her brothers, Will and Dan, came into the house through the back door, carrying an axe and a hatchet. Kale was seated on the back porch and probably thought they were coming after him. Will later claimed they did not see him out there. Prior to that moment, Daniel, 24, had bathed and dressed himself. He, like his sister, was a dapper young man with dark eyes and hair. His father, Robert, and brother, William, had already retired to their beds for the night. When his mother came in and reported that John Malloy was in the cottage with Sadie, Dan woke Will and told him to grab an axe and follow him to Sadie's. Upon seeing Sadie in such a shameful state with the man they had forbidden her to see, they became enraged. According to William's testimony, Dan took the hatchet and buried it into Malloy's skull, splitting his head open and probably causing instant death. He then hit Sadie on the side of the head twice. Her wounds didn't break the bone, but knocked her senseless. Daniel realized Malloy had a gun in his pocket and reached inside and pulled the gun out. Thinking quickly, he took the weapon and placed the barrel inside the wounds he had inflicted with the hatchet and pulled the trigger. If Sadie wasn't dead by the hatchet, she was certainly dead now. He then put the bloody hatchet against the wall and carried the gun into his parents' house. Hearing the commotion and gunshots, Robert Greenhill quickly dressed and headed to Sadie's. He met his sons coming back. They convinced him to turn around and go back inside with them. Will scurried into his room where he lifted the mattress on his bed to hide the axe. Dan showed the bloodied gun to his mother and quipped, Your mother is what did the work for my sister. He cleaned the gun and quickly returned it to the floor beside Malloy. By this time, Malloy's father had arrived at the door. It didn't take but a moment before Caleb Andrus came in the front door and other neighbors showed up to find out what was going on. The first impression was that John Malloy had shot Sadie and then himself, and this theory was allowed to be floated about until the coroner arrived and mentioned that there were hatchet and axe wounds on both bodies. At that observation, Will and Dan claimed that upon seeing what they supposed to be the corpses of Sadie and Malloy, they became enraged and began hacking at the bodies. This startling piece of information led to the arrest of William and Daniel Greenhill and Caleb Andrus. The following day, a new inquest was held. Most of the first witnesses had arrived less than five minutes after the shots were heard and said the blood was already clotted on both victims. This evidence was corroborated by three physicians who testified that it appeared that the gunshot wounds had been inflicted after the hatchet wounds. Funerals were held on the same day for Sadie Greenhill Oren and John Malloy. Sadie's funeral was held in her parents' home, and she was buried in the Catholic cemetery in DeSoto. Her ex-husband rushed to DeSoto upon hearing the news. Still professing to be in love with her, he was heartbroken. The Brotherhood of Railway Trainmen conducted the funeral at the Boyd Street M.E. Church for John Malloy. He was buried in St. Francis County in the Bismarck Masonic Cemetery. That evening, Daniel and William Greenhill were charged with murder in the first degree. Upon hearing the warrant, both men cried bitterly. Caleb Andrus was charged with accessory to murder. His arrest greatly surprised him but many agreed he was the only one who likely knew exactly what had happened that evening, but he was not giving any information. Fearing a lynch mob, the men were taken to the commercial hotel where they were held under guard instead of the jailhouse in DeSoto. 
The most sensational bit of information that was given by the medical examination was that the victims had been struck with the blows from the axe and or hatchet, and afterwards the muzzle of the gun was placed inside the wounds to shoot them. When the blood was cleaned away and the edges of the wounds placed together, they fit perfectly and no sign of powder residue appeared on the outside. When questioned, William Greenhill said that the family was upset with the way Sadie lived. They did not approve of her seeing suitors and especially didn't approve of John Malloy. They considered him a spendthrift and believed he only wanted to marry her for her money. According to Will, he and Dan decided they'd rather see her dead than married to Malloy. The outcome of the trial seemed to be obvious. However, at the trial in May 1902, evidence was introduced which threw a new light on the matter and opened up the possibility for doubt in the case. First was the testimony of an acquaintance whom Malloy had asked to borrow a pistol. Although the request was denied, Malloy and the witness did visit a saloon together. He recalled Malloy stating that it would be the last time they drank together. The clerk at Slauson's Hardware identified the pistol used in the murder as the one Malloy bought the afternoon of the murder. Mrs. Nora Greenhill testified that she overheard Malloy threaten that he would shoot Sadie down like a dog before he'd accept her living with another man. But the most compelling piece of evidence was a letter alleged to have been found in Malloy's pocket the night of the murders, which read as follows, quote, New Commercial Hotel, DeSoto, Missouri, September 28, 1901. My dear mother, I have made up my mind that I do not care to live any longer. Sadie is the only woman I ever loved. She has discarded me, so I have made up my mind that she won't have the chance to do anyone else the same, for we will die together. Take my insurance money and build a little house, and don't grieve about me, for I have made my peace with my dear God. I am better off dead. You have no idea how I have acted. Please forget me as soon as you can. I know it will go awful hard with you, but I can't help it. My sincere love to all. Bury me in a cheap coffin. Don't let the expense be over $75. I would like to be buried at Doe Run. Also would like for the brakeman to bury me. I do not care for anyone but you, for the kids will soon get over it. Now, Mother dear, I would not tell you when I was with you this afternoon, for I did not want you to get disheartened with me. Well, I guess this is all I have to say. I am ready to go. Goodbye, Mother. Don't grieve about me. Love to all. May God help you all. I have made my peace with him. Your devoted son, John H. Malloy. The envelope was addressed to Mrs. V. Malloy, DeSoto, Missouri, and was endorsed, Quote, we have agreed to die together, S and J, end quote. The confusion of the confession stating the intent to commit murder-suicide gave the defense the opportunity to point out the obvious fact that William Greenhill's mental deficiency could be the explanation for the confession he gave, which is what Daniel Greenhill insisted was the case. It still didn't explain why the two would have mutilated the bodies of Sadie and Molloy if they were already dead, but that point didn't factor into the jury's decision. Charges were dropped against Cale Andrus, and the Greenhill brothers were acquitted. When Sadie's estate was settled, her parents and siblings all received $100 apiece. That is equivalent to over $3,300 today. The Greenhill family eventually moved to Farmington. Daniel Greenhill married Margaret Anna Boyer in 1906 and had a large number of children. His hot temper landed him in trouble several times throughout the years. In 1915, he got into an argument with John Hayes when the two were drinking together at Ed Gurman's saloon in DeSoto. 
They started out joking with one another, but at one point, Hayes went too far. They were discussing the war, and Hayes remarked that Greenhill didn't know what he was since his mother was French and his father was Dutch. Suddenly, Greenhill pulled a knife and stabbed Hayes several times, cutting a main artery in his leg. Hayes was a married man with young children. He had buried one child only the day before. Daniel was tried in October 1915 for murder and was sentenced to serve two years in the penitentiary. Upon his release, his family moved to Dupo, St. Clair County, Illinois, where he lived until his death in 1946. William Greenhill was admitted to the State Hospital in Farmington, Missouri, diagnosed with paranoid praecox psychosis or early dementia and died there in 1950 at the age of 82. K.L.W. Andrus married Matilda Colonel. They had no children. For whatever reason, he took the secrets of the night of September 28, 1901 to his grave. Thank you for listening to this episode of The Jaded Love Murders. Please remember to like, subscribe, and comment. It really helps grow the channel. And if you want more behind-the-scenes content, consider becoming an Assistant Sleuth or Genealogy Sleuth member. And join me next month for another episode of Old Fashioned Murder and Mayhem.